Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Wonder Goal, the soccer betting podcast from the Action Network. My name is Michael Lebop. Joining me, as always, are my co-hosts, partners in crime, all of us bathing in our riches from Morocco, advancing to the round of 16 in the Women's World Cup, BJ Cunningham, and the recently retired Anthony DeBundo uh, <laughs> by way of Morocco. Um, and we also have a special guest for our second straight season. Alan Shapiro of the FML FPL pod is here with us to do our annual point total draft in the Premier League. Alon, before we get into the draft, uh, I just want to get a quick 60-second summary from you on how you see the league. Anthony, BJ, and I went deep into uh, the futures markets in our big season preview podcast. So if you're listening to this, you probably know how we feel and how BJ is basically betting Arsenal Minus 200 to win the league at this point. Okay. No matter what the number is, he's he's going to take it. Um, what about you? What do you think? How do you how do you see this yeah, wild I, Premier I, League shaking out? I haven't listened to the Futures pod yet, which is, is good, actually, because it won't color my thinking too much, I don't think. But, uh, I mean, obviously, I think City are going to win and are by far the best team. I don't think that's a surprise to anyone. But I think it's a fun, chaotic season incoming. I think there's huge variance with top, All of the top eight teams except City. I think there's also a gigantic pool of teams that could just be a disaster and get relegated. So both of those things make for an interesting, maybe hard to watch as a fan of one of those teams season, but definitely like high scoring, fun, interesting, good, competitive. So yeah, excited. We've called it the year of the blob because there's two blobs this year and then there's like nobody actually in the middle. (laughs) <laughs> there's yeah, one yeah. there's one team in the middle it's just brentford they're in their own maybe, maybe villa there's a nine yeah there's a top nine blob and then a bottom 10 blob and then there's just brentford in their own little yeah camp. pretty much i pretty much agree with that <laughs> yeah, yeah it's nuts um all right uh so before we get into our draft just here's how it works it's a snake draft we're all gonna pick our uh your favorite to- season point total over under whatever it is um we'll go through all 20 teams. So if Alon's favorite point total is Arsenal under, um, <laughs> he would take that off the drop off the board first. And then it would be BJ's turn. Then it's my turn. Then it's Anthony's turn. And of course, uh, a reminder that uh, wonder goal is presented by bet three, six, five, the world's favorite sports book brand, uh, sign up a promo code action to get bet three, six, five's exclusive sign up offer, Bet one dollar on any game, get $200 in bonus bets. Maybe you want to use some of those bonus bets on some of these over, unders that we'll be talking about today you must be 21 or older the offer is available in colorado new jersey ohio the commonwealth of virginia and bj's wonderful home state of iowa in the united states and if you have a gambling problem please call or text 1-800-GAMBLER alon floor is yours who you taking first pick is is tough dude but uh i think i'm gonna go BJ's next, so I'm tempted to just take Arsenal off the board, but I think I'm going to go Wolves under. Uh, yeah, it's a good pick. We, we um, spent a lot of time talking about Wolves last night. A lot just, of time. I mean, the thing is, I think that if you don't look at the stats, the narrative is sort of Lopetegui came in, you know, cleaned it up, made them tough to beat. Like, but, like they, that is just not what happened. Like, they were just really bad and just won some games somehow um, and picked up some points somehow and, and got out of it. And coming into the season, I mean, they're doing the opposite of improving the team. It just seems like they're getting worse across the board unless like, you know, Fabio Silva has a breakout year or something like that. But I just don't really see the upside. I don't really see them like spending in January to make the team better or in the rest of the current transfer window. I'm just very out on them. And it's tough because there's a lot of bad teams. So, you know, they can't all get under 39 and a half points. But yeah, I think they're bad. So I'm out. It's it's, it's an interesting total, right? 39 and a half, because it's the the question is essentially, will they be safe? Yeah. Considering, you know, 40 points is usually the marker, although it's taken a little less than that in the past. Um, So you're betting almost a yes, no is as well as in in a relegation fight. And all four of us would would be in agreement here that the yeah. answer is unequivocally yes. Uh, so you can pencil <laughs> them in for a top six spot. That yeah. was first uh, on my board. For sure. Oh yeah. <laughs> good, good, good. Uh, all right, PJ, uh, you're up. Uh, should we just 
point people to the title talk last night and, and you can take the arsenal over? No, I'm going to go a little bit of a different direction, Michael. I think, you know, one of you got losers is going to take the Arsenal under here in a little bit. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to go Brighton over 57 and a half. I think okay. a dangerously low total for how good Brighton was last season. I mean, they finished last year with 71 expected points. So now you have to look at their roster and you say, okay, there's going to be some natural regression with Brighton, but are we talking 14 points of regression? I don't see it. You know, it just came out today that it looks like Caicedo is going to stay at least for, till January. It looks like nobody's going to meet the hundred million dollar asking price that Brighton wants. And it sounds like he's going to be, he's, you know, comfortable with his position right now. So they're going to have their best player. They obviously lost McAllister, but I mean, Anthony, Anthony said this last night and it's true. They have so many wonderful replacements. They just keep finding all these South American wonder kids to just replace them. So now, and CISO is going to replace McAllister. Is that really that massive of a drop off for Brighton? I don't think so. And they were awesome under Deserby. Like they were one of the best teams in the Premier League. They consistently just would break down low blocks again and again and again, creating over two expected goals per 90 minutes. So for them to be this low of a point total and to be below teams like Tottenham and Chelsea is is kind of it's kind of crazy in my opinion so i i love brighton over 57 and a half points i think there's tremendous value on that i'm happy that uh first i was a little nervous you're gonna take this one bj just because i know how much you love this team i like spurs over 60 mm. and a half interesting they finished with 60 points last year and they were one of the most disappointing teams relative to their expectations of an entire season i think they're just they're flat out better going into this year. We trust the manager to to kind of give them a bump. Less to worry about in terms of European football. Richarlison, second year breakout for them, I believe. So yeah, I like Spurs over. I I, I talked about it on our preview pod. I think that Spurs are a team that I'm I'm happy to play a little sprinkle on, on them to win the title or to do something crazy. And uh this kind of just leads into that as well. So I'll take Anthony Spurs to go over 16 and a half, which is essentially, will they be better than they were last year? This feels like a sick joke that the the three of the top four on my board are already off the board and I haven't gotten a chance to pick yet. <laughs> uh, so we are all in agreement. I agree with all three picks. I think Tottenham, you're buying at the ultimate floor. They could sell Harry Kane, but then I'd expect some kind of reinvestment and, and a new striker, uh, you know, making a late move for a new striker if he were to be sold. I don't think this is something that's going to happen I know on deadline day where all of a sudden three matches in Kane is gone. I think it's something that's going to happen within the next week or two, if he does go Uh, and if he does stay, then I think that Tottenham with James Madison and maybe some improved tactics and a a different way of playing and maybe LaCelso getting re re into the team. Like I'm I'm kind of uh, in enough on Tottenham to say that 60 and a half is probably a touch low and probably as low as you're ever going to see Tottenham in the modern league given their resources and their squad. So uh, I, I certainly think you're buying at the floor there. Uh, I am going to sell high on the Hodgson Palace team here. <laughs> I'm out. Ooh. I'm so out at 43 and a half. Uh, Crystal Palace may keep Olise. They may not. Uh, I think ultimately the money and the prospect is going to potentially have him on the way out. But if they were to lose him, uh, they would be losing uh, three of their top uh, six ball progressors their top chance creator in Elise, their top dribbler in Zaha. Uh, and, and they really haven't had any news in terms of bringing in players to replenish that and to score more goals. We talked you know, on our show last night about how we like the defensive solidity and how it gives them a decent floor. But at a certain point, they're just not going to be able to score goals. And I think that they're, go- they're in real danger of getting dragged into the mud with these other teams in the so-called blob. Uh, that I don't really know that there's going to be be able to win enough games to get to you know 43 and a half. Remember, this is a team uh, that got to 45 last year. They were incredibly volatile because of the schedule. They had that really uh, bad start. Then they they started winning because they played weaker teams. And they had a really brutal stretch. They fired Vieira. They then they had a, a decent finish to the season. But again, if they don't replace any of their attacking output, the entire attack is just going to be Eze. And I, I really don't think that's enough. Uh, without a true goal scorer, Mateta has never really put consistent production together. So I'm kind of down on Palace uh, relative, and, and I think it's going to be you know in that mix of teams that has the chance on the outside of getting relegated here. Uh, so I, I'm down on them. 
That's my first pick. My second pick is uh, going to be very similar. It's West Ham under 46 and a half points. Uh, if you look just at last year's data, you would say that West Ham was a positive regression candidate, right? They had 51 expected points uh, and they finished the season with only 40. They were one of the biggest XG underperformers in attack, but another year uh, older from Mikel Antonio, uh, Skamaka is somebody that hasn't really put up good production numbers in his time uh, at West Ham and hasn't, it may not even be at the team. It looks like he may leave, go back to, to Italy. So where are the goals coming from? And then just the midfield, like they haven't really addressed their problem. I don't even think, uh, you know, the word prowess thing isn't coming to fruition, but I don't even think that would have solved a lot of their problems. Suchek doesn't really get on the ball. He doesn't really pass. Uh, and Rice covered for him so much. I mean, Rice had more than double the second most passes into the final third for, for West Ham uh, and way more carries than anybody else on that team, way more tackles, way more interceptions, just the do everything player. And we are now, you know, we're recording this August 3rd. They can make some moves between now and the end of the transfer window, but they're also in Europe. They're one of the oldest teams last year. They didn't have a ton of squad depth. It just feels like things have gotten very stale at West Ham uh, and that they could be in some real trouble as well in the potential relegation picture. So I'm playing against West Ham and Crystal Palace. Uh, West Ham under uh, 46 and a half points. All right, that, that brings me back uh, to the front of the line. I'm going to go with another over here and I'm going to go over on Bournemouth at 38 uh, and a half. Uh, this is another yes, no, really. Will the, will Bournemouth be really fighting uh, in a relegation battle? I'm sure that they're going to feel some pressure, uh, but this team, I, I bet the under on this draft on Bournemouth at 32 and a half last year, um, thinking they were, they were going to be far and away the worst team in the league. I was, very wrong about that. It's the only thing I was wrong about all season, actually. Um, and uh, <laughs> now I'm changing my tune. Uh, we like the the managerial switch with former NYCFC legend uh, Adoni Iraola coming in. This team should just be flat out better. More money coming in. They looked great in the second half uh, of last year. I expect that to kind of just continue. And I don't feel that they are as bad as the market's kind of implying here, making them essentially one of the the favorites to be, to be relegated, just a, a nose ahead of uh, Nottingham Forest or in some places, basically their peer. Uh, so I'll take Bournemouth over. I think that this team ends up doing a little bit of what Brentford did their first season. Just, just having a, a very impressive, no, no real pressure on them by the time we get towards the, the, the meat and potatoes part of the season where they can kind of cruise to a 12th or uh, 13th place finish and look good doing it and uh, take some take some pretty big wins along the way i think they're an underdog you're going to want to invest in uh, all season when they're in that like you know 11 to 1 range against some of these really big teams at the top of the table um so we'll take the cherries bj i'm, I'm assuming you had your eye on them too so i did i'm sorry that's okay uh because one of my favorite picks is still on the board and that's fulham under 41 and a half points it looks like right now, I mean, as of July 23rd, we haven't heard any news, but it looks like Alexander Mitrovic is off to the Saudi league, which is, you know, incredibly massive because you can make the argument that he is the most important player to his individual team of anybody in the Premier League. I mean, last season, you know, he obviously got suspended for an extended period of time. He missed some matches due to injury, ended up missing actually 14 matches. Fulham's expected goals with him in the lineup was 1.37 per match without him. It was 0.88, which would have made them the worst offense in the entire Premier League. And their entire offense is built around just swinging crosses into, is, and crosses into him because he's incredibly good at playing in the air and you know getting uh, the ball off those crosses and putting it in the back of the net. They signed Raul Jimenez, who didn't score in a goal last season and looks completely washed up uh, as his replacement. So that's really concerning. And then you also have the fact that they, you know, by some XG models – conceded the most expected goals of anybody in the Premier League. And they were being held up by a 34-year-old Tim Ream who had just this complete breakout season. And yes, they signed Calvin Bassey, who's you know somewhat going to help them. He's more of a ball progressor than an actual like defensive uh, upgrade for them. So there's so much negative regression coming here for Fulham. I don't know where the goals are coming from for them. You also have the fact that Paul, it looks like, uh, Paulini is going to be out for the first few matches, uh, which is also concerning. So uh, 
yeah, they're they're one of our favorite teams to get relegated here. And if they're going to get relegated, um, they're definitely going under 41 points. So I like their under. Yeah, that was a, a team that we all were in agreement about being in some serious trouble. I, I like the to finish last uh, at 20 to 1 because I, I just think that this team has turmoil written all over it. I think a lot of teams that we've we've kind of talked about already, Wolves, uh, West Ham, Fulham, are, are all interesting in terms of like first manager sacked bets uh, and mm-hmm. that kind of stuff or first manager to leave his post because Marco Silva loves doing that. So uh, <laughs> we'll see uh, just how long uh, and, and how crazy the season gets for the cottagers uh alan back to you for two in a row yeah a lot of my favorite picks are taken off the board here i think i'm gonna go with a related double pick here that might be controversial but i'm gonna go over arsenal under liverpool and Love i do it. think and i do think they're related um interesting as we've gotten further in the transfer window and Liverpool's instability, losing Hendo and Fabinho, and just not having a six when we're, you know, seven days basically from the start of the season. I just think that Arsenal's now clearly the second best team in the league. Whereas, like, maybe a month ago, you could have been like, oh, there's other teams in there. And I think that usually the way the points go in a Premier League season is there's not room for two teams to get over this, like, you know, Liverpool's at 75 and a half. Like, there's not three teams going, you know, a uh, uh, winner, someone sort of close, and then someone at like 77, 78. That's just not usually how it goes. There's not that many points to go around. And I think basically Arsenal are just better, more importantly, deeper, even if you think the on, mm-hmm. on the pitch stuff isn't that big of a, of a needle mover, which I kind of don't. Um, I just think the depth is so huge and that'll just, you know, cover any, any potential issue. Um, and I just think, so the Liverpool and under people like Liverpool, Man United, Newcastle, Chelsea Spurs, I just, I think there's going to be so much inconsistency in the league this year. There's so much changeover. There's new managers, there's tons of new players, there's new systems, Yada, yada, yada. I just think Arsenal will, they're the one team that's just better and deeper and stable and has the same team and has the same manager and has the same style of play. And I think they'll just separate themselves from the pack. How's that feel, BJ? That's a, that's a great point, Alan. I mean, that was very insightful, <laughs> very smart, uh, smart uh, uh, statement there from Alan. I mean, obviously, oh, I on. agree because. You're, you're Excuse a big, me. Yeah, God. Sorry, I was gonna say, yeah, Alan, that was that was beautiful. I mean, we, we, you know, the Arsenal, what they've done in the transfer window has been obviously vital for them to become that, you know, second best team in the Premier League. Like, you know, like you mentioned, if they kept the same squad from last season, I think we'd probably say Liverpool and even United is, you know, probably better than Arsenal. But they went out and got the best defensive midfielder in the entire world, in Declan Rice. They went and got cover for their right center back position in Timber, somebody who can also play right back, who can invert into the middle of the pitch, create so much tactical flexibility for Arteta. And then they also have the two best wingers in the Premier League. And Anthony okay, not admit <laughs> that Eddie Niketa is a good striker. He thinks he's horrible. He thinks he's below he's average. Mid. And he thinks that he is just an absolute he's, he's liability for Arsenal he's, he's on the pitch is, is what Anthony thinks. Yeah, I know the, the Jesus injury isn't a great start to my draft. But no, not at all. That's, that's the thing. So but, I, I was going to say. But Balogun's good too. Yep. Kai can get in there if he needs to. I don't know. I, I, I think they'll cover it with their depth. Yep. I think I think it's going to be tested early on. And I think um, if they don't get another leap from like a soccer or Martinelli, I think then – the not already having Jesus and his injury problems could pro- prop up as a potential issue. No. They also just finished like ridiculously well last year. They yeah. were, they were 25, 30% above XG most of the season. Uh, that's not something that I expect to continue. So, you know, there could be some regression in terms of goals for Arsenal uh, that, that I think is per- certainly within the cards, especially uh, given the youth that they do have, it can work in one way where everybody gets better and they continue to gel but it can also be that if Saka and Martinelli stagnate and then, you know, Jesus isn't quite as uh, fit, you know, that, that hurts certainly. And I, I'm not an Eddie Nketiah guy. I think he's okay. He's fine. He's a fine backup striker, 
but he can't lead the line for a team that's making a title charge. Yeah, but so. Trossard can, and Balogun might, and Kai can. I mean, when Trossard they came all in might. For I don't know that there's Petia, the guy. Whereas with Liverpool, Arsenal like I, well, I you know? trust Nunez and Salah, like their their production and potential ceilings much more. And that's that's where I'm kind of like I don't really have a, a big gap between the two teams. Yeah, uh, I'm concerned for sure about Liverpool's defense, but Liverpool putting up uh, they did improve the defense in the second last two months of the year. I'm curious if you believe that or you think that's just small sample. Like, what do you, you're a Liverpool I guy. I don't believe that. Like, at this point, there's no number six. We're a week out from the season. Uh, you know, like preseason, you can do whatever you want. Tell whatever story you want with the preseason. But, I mean, they're just conceding chances left and right in the exact same way that they did last season. Um, and, you know, the, the, the theory, I think, is that they should get better with better pressing from the midfielders and from the forwards, which makes sense with the new midfielders that they have and the forwards they have. But at the same time, it's the same defenders. Andy Robertson's kind of out of position. You know, Virgil's older. Matip's older. I like Kanate, but he can never stay fit. Again, no number six. It's just like, even if things go right, I still expect an adjustment period. And basically, like, where I'm coming at with Arsenal is I agree with all the overperformance and all that stuff. And I think I'm actually a little bit lower than most people on their transfer window. It's just that the point total is not that high. I mean, 77 and a half isn't, you know, if it was 82, I'd be under all the way. I'm like, I don't know. But I just feel like they can just be better than the group and get to 78, 79. And that's like a disappointing season if you're an Arsenal fan, but I think that's very realistic. And like, they're pretty safe to do that with their defense and with their team. And Liverpool, again, they're, you know, they have upside obviously with Klopp and with their talent, but they're the highest point total of the blob, as you guys call it, outside of City and Arsenal, who I think are clearly number one and number two. And so for me, that's just an under, like philosophically an under, whereas like I'm like they're competing with Man United, Newcastle, Chelsea, Spurs, Villa, mm-hmm. Brighton, whoever you want to throw in. I'm like, I'll go under on the highest and I'll go over on the lowest, which is Brighton, which is already off the board. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. We, we were talking about that a lot yesterday. I, I said it's like if you if you watch horse racing, um, you know, the Kentucky Derby, the reason we love it so much is it's the field is so wide. Right. Um, and when you do that, it just adds to the chaos and the variance and these horses will start cannibalizing one another and getting each other's way. <laughs> um, so that's that's my my theory on, on why I don't think that any of the teams being offered at short odds um, to win the title are worth betting and why I landed on Tottenham. Uh, if, I mean, if you thrown United and Tottenham spot on the board, I would just said made the same argument for. Yeah, exactly. For United. Exactly. Um, and that's same with me. Right. So to go on on this but like if united were the highest of this group or newcastle were highest of the group i would bet the exact same under like i would have the exact same argument yep. of just you know yeah i think it's fair i, I'm uh, not, I don't necessarily disagree I, I would i would go uh if i had to i would probably do under on both but that's just my principle yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right uh bj uh, that yeah. brings us. That brings Arsenal's us off the board for him. Arsenal's off, off the, the board. board. I had to take him. He that's knew okay. I wasn't going okay. on Arsenal, <laughs> and that's okay because my next pick is going to be Newcastle over sixty-seven and a half points. Interesting. Uh, you know, Newcastle's a team that we really like to finish in the top four once again. It's the, this point total is essentially saying is that because Newcastle isn't a big six club, there's going to be this natural regression for them back towards the pack, right? But I. And I know Michael and Anthony agree with me that we don't really see it that way. You know, obviously Newcastle has money now. So they went out in the transfer market and they went and got Tenali. They went and got Harvey Barnes. They retooled their squad while the rest of the big six and other big clubs are spending money to get better. And Newcastle, I mean, they finished the second best expected goal differential in the Premier League last season. Like they were incredibly impressive and they do this thing tactically that just makes them so difficult to play against where they can just beat you up so badly. They're so physical. If you try to build up against them, they press you so intensely that they essentially force you to play the ball long and get into a transition end to end type battle with them. And they are just so, so good in those transitional opportunities. So it makes them like very, very difficult to play against. Now, the thing about them is, and this is something we talked about is 
you know, towards the end of last season when, you know, a lot of teams didn't view them as a big six club, you know, they would come out and they would press them and they wouldn't, you know, you know, treat them like they would a city or an arsenal and play a lot deeper. So now you're going to see teams play more defensive, play more passive against Newcastle. So they're going to have to start to break down more low blocks than rather than getting those transitional opportunities. But I mean, this is a team that still was a top five team by expected goals. You have another year of Alexander Ishak, who is a top five striker in the premier league. Callum Wilson, even in limited minutes had an unbelievable season from an XG perspective and they can play them both at the same time. So and, you know, with the midfielders, obviously, Gimarish and Tonali. I mean, there's just so many pieces for this Newcastle team that really make me believe that they're not going to drop off. So 67 and a half only being one point higher than Chelsea, I think is crazy. So I love Newcastle over 67 and a half. Yeah, we, we were talking about them. Just I think they're a, a stable, stable team. And um, the ceiling is, is so high if they're in a, in a title race or something crazy that the Saudi princes are just going to be like, let's just buy everybody. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's, 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 that's not a, that's not a outside the realm of possibilities. Mbappe. Like, yeah. Like Mbappe just, Hey, let's just throw January 6, 6.2 billion yeah. at them to see if we can steal a, a champions league or a, a premier league title. Um, yeah, I like that. I'm going to go would Mbappe start over Isak on the left wing. I don't know. I think it's debatable. <laughs> oh, of course, of course not. No, <laughs> they'd have to, Mbappe would have to play. Off Especially the right. when we got Isak in a golden boot race. I mean, yeah. oh, gosh, no. <laughs> uh, all right. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'm going to take an under here. My fr- I've, I've taken a couple over, so I, I'm going to, uh, flip the script a little bit and go under on Burnley at 39 and a half. Oh, I, don't think it's just going to be as straightforward as this number suggests for them. Um, we we talked about uh, you know Fulham and the the season that they had coming out of the championship when they just set the world on fire down there, uh, and and then you know you expect that an adjustment period a little bit like you know I I, I think we all I love Vincent Company for for the goal he scored to to make sure that Liverpool didn't win that title and <laughs> and, I, and I love him just just generally uh, as a person but like. We're talking about a pretty significant step up for for this team. They're going to play a style that if you're not a expected to be a good team, and you're going to come and try to like outplay teams like Brighton or whoever, uh, put the ball on the carpet, you can find yourself in some some trouble. Thirty nine and a half is telling you yes, no on a on a them being in a relegation once again, and I just think that they're going to be in one. Like this is this is not a team that I think is just going to cruise a la Brentford a couple years ago again using that example um, and just feel safe so I don't think that they're they're like they're necessarily going down but I think that they're going to be in the thick of it for for this entire season that's why I like the under I think that also I, I haven't really seen a a championship team hyped like this before which is funny because old Burnley was maybe the least hyped team you know we've ever seen in like there's a premier league mainstay so uh it's it's gonna be an adjustment period i think for a lot of people um when they when they come back up so i'll take that the under on burnley uh at 39 and a half is anyone buying into the nathan tella breakout i don't know no he's not even there right they 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 need to replace so many goals and xg and shots that's and that's, they, that's the thing for me then the more no i goals. look into burnley the more i'm kind of concerned about them like i came into it thinking like oh yeah great underlying numbers and then like yeah. nathan Tella, like oh great he had wait a minute that was their whole team and jay rodriguez <laughs> mm-hmm. had 10 goals in the championship yeah, Rod's back, Ashley barnes jay Rod's Ashley barnes put in six like i like the system i like the manager i think the number is kind of right i think they're 50 50 to be in that race i think there's a chance that that teams fall below them but then there's also a chance that like we were looking at we had this discussion last night too like top promoted team they're minus 250 that's crazy to me i don't think there's that big of a gap between them and and the rest of the you know other two teams behind them so that is crazy to eat up that much of the market share on on a what is it it's 12 basically 12 points they're saying that they're better than 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 luton which is I think I'm taking. I think I'm taking Luton plus twelve. Yeah, right. Like you offer no, me that market. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's, I'm definitely it's, taking Luton plus twelve. It's, it's a little much. Um, and also there's this is another kind of manager that wouldn't be surprised if he ends up, you know, if if, if a, up. A, a big spot opens up somewhere else in the league, he gets his head turned. Um, 
So just don't take just don't take dessert deserve away from Brighton. Yeah. Anybody else can go. Uh, maybe that's Brighton's succession plan. Yeah, you know, it could you know, be. Right? Like <laughs> maybe is the guy. Zerbi goes to coach uh, the U.S. men's national team or something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Anthony, you're up. This is this is where it starts getting a little tough. I'm looking at the board and I'm like, oh man, I don't. You can, I, don't... I know what over you want to take. You could take them. I'm giving you my permit. You're giving you permission. With the Hatters? No. Oh. Uh. I know what he's talking about. Let's talk about his blues. Or, oh, my blues. Yeah, your blues, baby. <laughs> I'm gonna pass on my blues for now. I'm gonna take. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna take Man United under seventy three and a half. Love it. <laughs> BJ is <laughs> contractually required to slander United every year. Yeah. Uh, it's funny. I'm actually recording this from a friend's house, uh, and he's a big United fan. And when I told him I was coming up to record it, he said, "Are you going to slander United again with your anti-United agenda?" And I said, "Well, I'm kind of agnostic about United, but we've gotten to the point now where uh, at 73 and a half, I'm sorry, like on what earth are they within three points, two points of Liverpool and Arsenal from last year? Then they've yeah. made some signings and additions that I'm interested in. That you know, uh, Ho- Holland uh, or Hoyland." Uh, that's going to be one of those names I'm struggling with all year, but like he has such a small track record and the, the Atalanta stuff, like he scored some goals. He had some decent expected goals, underlying numbers. The shots weren't great. So like, can he put, can he put the numbers together in, in this United team in the center? Cause if he can't, then they're kind of still have the same problem where they had the fourth longest average shot distance, uh, and it's really hard to maintain an elite attack if you can't generate high quality shots. And United was not very good at it last year. Rashford had like a breakout finishing season and and had that incredible run. But once he slowed down into the full into the finish, he only had three goals in his last eleven league games. Once he slowed down, there just weren't a lot of goals for this United team to go around. And then they struggled uh, outside of a couple games against teams who had already quit, like a ch- like that Chelsea game. So I think that United uh, is probably better than last year. And I understand they finished in the top four last year and, and would have gone over this number. But keep in mind that they overperformed to get to that number. So I think even if United is better this year, they may end up right around the same. I think the league behind them is better. Uh, I, I'm I think Onana's an upgrade over De Gea, but again, like this team kept a ton of clean sheets last year, uh, and I just don't really think that's repeatable. I said this to Alon when I was on his show. They conceded more expected goals than Tottenham last year. So there's a long way for this defense to come before they're really in the level to be a consistently uh, elite defense. So expect the goals allowed. Uh, they were, uh, you know, pretty, pretty alarmingly mediocre. Yeah. Right, so so my, yeah. The, the, the other, I just want to throw in like them being that high on the table sort of required like a Chelsea absolute meltdown season and Spurs being bad too, right? Like they, they picked up eight points off those two teams. So I think we're all kind of thinking like it's more of a blob, right? That's just less points for them available potentially. I think the one thing that, that kind of scares me a little bit is that like because of these mid table teams, not spending money, you could see the gap and it could be that the top teams, you know, like a way to palace, a way to Fulham, a way to wolves. Just win them all. Like they just might, the top teams might just win a lot of these games. Yeah. More than, more than they normally would. Like you're not going to see that drop point at Wolves or the drop points at Palace uh, as much this year. And the dregs are going to stay the dregs. You know, you expect the top teams, you know, they'll slip up here and there, but they're expected to win. If the mid table gets hollowed out, does that mean that the top, like the, the bar to clear to get to the top four is a little higher this year? I think there is a possibility. Um, because you know when the two in the top seven eight teams play against each other, it's always a war. But you know the nine to fourteen being worse could lead to uh, some more openings for yeah. sure. All right, my next pick. Uh, this team cost me more money in the spring than any team like in the history of soccer, <laughs> and it's a shame because we've made so much money betting him in the past. And it's Aston Villa. Oh, I yeah. Have, I have to go. Yeah, on. I know. I have to go under uh, at, the, at the number 58 and a half. Uh, I think it's just a little high. Uh, look, I understand the system. I respect the manager. I actually watched them live in the friendly against uh, Newcastle a couple of weeks ago in Philly. And like this high line that they're playing, given their personnel, it's, 
the kind of thing that as teams get more used to seeing it, I think you're going to see more exposed back line. And Emmy Martinez, first of all, they ran really good defensively in the second half of the season. Secondly, Emmy Martinez had an awesome shot, shot stopping second half of the season. Once Emery came in, this was not a good defense uh, relatively last season. Uh, and now Pau Torres is a really good addition. And I think that, uh, you know, underrated addition, but this Villa defense um, expected goal difference in the second half of the season. So post world cup per understat, they had a plus one for the, for the entire second half uh, 20 matches. So this was not a team that was putting up uh, absurd numbers or like really took a huge leap. Like you could see that the tactics and the plan was better, but they had a plus 11 actual goal difference because they overperformed at both ends of the pitch. Uh, and all in all, they had, you know, 30 expected points in the second half of the season, finished with 54.3. How much better can they get? So at 58 and a half, I, I think this late in the draft, it's 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 a steal for me. And I think that they aren't really that close to the top top seven or eight. Now, one of them could fall out, like could just have a shit year, and they could sneak into the seventh or eighth. But I really don't think with Europe now, too, that they have the depth and the ability to to stay in that that level. So I, I do think there is some regression coming for Villa, and I think they're probably a top half team by default, but that they're not going to get to 58 and a half. Yeah, one one thing I want to add to that, and the TIFO guys did a fantastic job breaking this down, is that you know while Pau Torres is an unbelievable defender or underviewable in terms of his ball progression forward, and he's like perfect because he's obviously been under Unai Emery, he's not really that great of a physical defender defending the box. And his positioning as a left center back would mean that Tyrone Mings would essentially have to go off the pitch because Tyrone Mings has never played right center back before. And Tyrone Mings is one of the best physical defenders in the air, so especially off the of set pieces. So when they have to face teams like, for example, a Brentford or a Tottenham or a Bournemouth, these teams that are physical and good on set pieces, like Pau Torres was in like, I think the 30th percentile for aerial dual win percentage among Europe's top five leagues like that. That's not going to work really. So works in Spain. Was, but was what yeah, it works in Spain. But what was interesting, I saw in the, their last uh friendly, Una Emery's never played a back three before, like ever. So it's like it's really weird for Aston Villa to switch that. He actually tried it. Like he played Tyrone Mings as the the center center back. He played uh Pau Torres on the left, and then he played Kansa on the right. So essentially that's what he's gonna have to do, and then play two wing backs, and he's gonna play probably Ollie Watkins and Diaby up top. So that could also work. But it's a whole new system for Unai Emery for him to implement like seven days before the season starts. So I don't know. Yeah, I agree with you. Like there, there's going to be some natural regression for them, obviously playing with the Europa Conference League. So we'll see. But yeah, they drastically overperformed and they're probably going under. And I love Musa Diaby, but I'm not yeah. sure that it's necessarily the best of fits for this team, to be honest. And I, I mean, he's better than Leon Bailey at right wing. So you can like <laughs> say that that's an upgrade. That's but um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, Buen, I mean Buendia. Uh, had a dynamo showing that day that I, the, the <laughs> only preseason that I've watched, because I don't really tune in too much for preseason because I think it just kind of biases me, people. But Buendia, if he's as good as he was that day, uh, then maybe I'm wrong. But this attack feels Sounds like, like bias to me. Yeah, th- this attack <laughs> this attack feels like um, like they're, they're so reliant on getting Watkins in like once a game and he better score it. And if they don't, then they're just not that good. Villa. Yeah, the, they're Villa's... playing right now. Three at, three at the back preseason. Speaking there you of, go. Uh, your bias. There yeah. you go. It um, might work. You know what's so frustrating? I had when we went into our podcast last night. I was thinking about you know, Villa and what, how, what I wanted to say about them. And I said, you know, Unai Emery wins every tournament he's ever entered. So um, I was looking at their EFL tro- uh, cup odds and their FA cup odds and they're hilariously short. They're like 20 to one to win the FA cup and 14 or 16 to one to win the EFL oh cup. My God. Yeah. yeah. Knocked out by a so, fr- so frustrating. What about the uh, conference league? I know, but what are they going to be in the conference? League? Fourth they be, favorite, they're probably going to be the third, favorites. Third the favorite. Conference. Yeah. At the worst. So come on. Screw Villa. I have not looked at the conference <laughs> league field too extensively in my preseason prep, but uh, I'm waiting for the draw to come out. The uh, Villa is, is like, is the anti of the team I'm, I'm about to go over on here, which is, uh, the team that has has made uh, made me the most money probably the past three mm-hmm. seasons in the Premier oh, League. No. Yeah. Ever did. no, I'm just kidding. Brentford. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I wanted this, but I, uh, I didn't think there was a way I'd get it. 
it's it's a fun conversation to have. 45 and a half. They were 59 last season, I believe. Um, so they were 46 the season before. So they went over this total in, in their two years uh, in, in the Premier League under Thomas Frank. And of course, the elephant in the room is that uh, Ivan Tony was behaving badly uh, by betting on soccer matches when he's a professional soccer player. So uh, he won't be playing for them and he's incredibly important. But I trust the manager um, and I trust the process and I trust this team to just be good enough to be hard to beat um, for the most part. When you look at the the cohort of teams below them, I, I expect them to just take care of business against a lot of very flawed teams. A- Anthony brought up uh, West Ham, same same point total basically as Brentford. Even without Tony, I would take Brentford versus over West Ham in a in a head to head. So, just on that logic alone, I I think uh, the bees are fine uh, when we get towards this this portion of the of the draft. And and I'm re- I'm excited to see how they're priced on a game to game basis. Uh, because you know the market never really came around on them last year. Like we every week on on Wonder Goal, what would we say? You know, when is the market going to respect this team? When is it going to respect this team? Now that they're talismanic strikers off the roster, the question is going to be when is it going to respect them? Uh, and maybe they don't just des- they won't end up deserving it without them. But is 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 it going to be that much of a drop off without them? Um. I don't think so. I think that'd be good enough to, to get over here. So uh, I'll, I'll stick with the bees. I mean, Michael match week one is the most Brentford spot of all time. Being a two plus 220 underdog against at home against Tottenham. Like that's oh just about, that's about as red. That's, I know. It's, <laughs> that's it's, just, it's a, it's the, the, the classic and it's just going to be perfect. It's going to be beautiful. It's, They're going to score off two set pieces. And by the way, uh, and I don't know. I mean, I know again, Alan, I know nothing about fantasy, but, uh, you know, Brentford are no dummies. They went out and got uh, Kevin Shade from Freiburg, who's like a six-foot striker who plays, like, incredibly well in the air and is really, really dangerous on set pieces. He's not Ivan Tony, but he might help uh, smooth over the drop-off, essentially, from what Brentford yeah. is. I mean, they, they knew this was coming. Like, it's it's the same question with, like, Potter and Deserby, really. We knew Potter was going to leave at some point, and, and Brighton was obviously going to have a, a plan in place, and... Uh, Brentford. I mean, if this was Everton, they they th- maybe they wouldn't. They would just be like, "Oh God, who could have saw that coming?" You know, all the tabloid <laughs> stories for six months about this, and now we got to react to that. But these are these are smart teams that uh, would have had a plan in place. So yeah, it's Wh- a point well Wh- taken, BJ. Wiss is the guy in <laughs> in fantasy. I mean, he's, okay, they buy him from Lorient. You know, after yeah. twenty twenty season, anticipating probably not a Tony suspension, but Tony getting bought by a big team right. probably. And he's just been coming off the bench, scoring goals at a really good rate. He puts up good XG and 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 shots when he starts, and he's just gonna be good, I think. Yeah, I, I'm all. I'm... Any any time goal scorer kind oh, of yeah. guy. Yeah, um, absolutely. Now I like Wisa too. I, I think that people forget he played a lot last year. Tony missed a bunch of time too. Yeah. So like, I think the the thing about Brentford is it's not about the man, it's about the system. And uh, I think the system is, is proven. Right. They do everything else well to kind of nullify the fact that like, and I think this is part of the reason the market is consistently undervalued them. If you look at that squad, you're not like, oh boy, look at all the talent on Brentford uh, outside of Tony. And now it's like, well, you know, oh boy, there's no talent. But that's never really been the case. Yeah. They just play better than their talent. And they they work around it and uh, outperform their numbers. So uh, I think that uh, Brentford over is always a good bet. All right, BJ. All right. Um, I could go one of two ways here. Um, I could crap all over Anthony's boy, but I'm not going to do that here because we're just before the season. So no, instead, is, Michael, isn't he, I'm gonna... he's managing. Isn't he managing a Saudi Arabian team with Jordan Henderson on? <laughs> I know. Um, I'm going to go uh, that that boy. Oh, I have too many people. You know, yeah. I cape for like half the league. So no, you call, I'm what do you call him? You I'm call not going to crap all over Pep. I'm Giar- not going to crap Giard- all over Coach Gino right now. I won't do it to you. I'm going to go Sheffield United over 31 and a half points. Wow. I think this is dangerously low for a team that was literally had the exact same expected goal differential as Burnley did in the championship, but you heard nothing about them. They and they play a system that can really work similar to the Brentford mold where they play out of a three, five, two, they play incredibly direct. They don't need a lot of possession. 
and they can also come out and press you really intensely. I mean, outside they had the second most high turnovers in the championship last season. And also what I found, I was digging into them. They only allowed nine expected goals over a 46 match season off of set pieces. Like that is incredibly good. Like they're very, very compact and good defensively. They have good center backs. They still have Sander Burge there. Who's a great, great uh, defensive midfielder in the middle of the pitch. And they just went out and got Austin trusty from, uh, who went <laughs> who on the hell loan. is that? <laughs> uh, he's an American. who was just on loan, had impressed at Don't Birmingham last either. season. <laughs> and he's going to be a nice replacement in there in the center of the pitch. The problem is, is they just still end die to uh, Marseille, who was their best attacking player. Now that's a problem and I get it, but for a team <laughs> that is going to be this solid defensively in the blob of the bottom of the table, like, I don't think there's really a, a essentially a seven or eight point gap between them or Burnley or a 10 point gap between them and Fulham. So, you know, over 30 you know, to get to 32 points. I mean, it's, it's really not asking a ton from them just to get results against the the blob. So uh, okay, I like, okay. I like the blades mm-hmm. over 31 and a half. It makes sense. No, I, 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 I would certainly I mean, it would be that or nothing. I, I couldn't take it under there. Yeah. I'm How sorry. bad can they be? Yeah. They they did sign a striker. I just know nothing about. Yeah, Adama Traore. The yeah. Old... What the <laughs> Benny Adama Traore. Benny Former Adama Traore. Uh, FC Sheriff legend, Adama Traore, Champions oh, League really? participant. Yeah. Wow. He Love scored that. twelve goals in Sweden last year. That's all you need to know. So I he's mean, basically his numbers are good. He's half an XG per 90, two and a half shots per 90. But, you know, it's in Sweden. So take off, what, 50% or something? Take off yeah. all the production. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, Alon. Is it me now? I think oh, it's you, you. You swing us back. Uh, Your last home, two picks. the home stretch here. What the hell do I even do with this? So what's left? It's City, Chelsea, Everton, <laughs> three best teams in the league. Forest and Luton. Yep, that's right. Man. I guess I'll go Chelsea under. Great pick. Um, mm. I could see them going over, but I just think more times than not, they go under. I, again, it's just, I'm saying the same thing over and over, but I just don't expect any consistency. Um, there's so much changeover. And Cuckoo is already hurt. New manager, tons of new players. You know, Reese James will be hurt in a week, I'm sure. Chilwell will be hurt in two weeks, I'm sure. Sociopath um, for an owner. <laughs> yes. Can't a get different kind Kasu- of sociopath than their last sociopath owner. <laughs> can't Literally get only have one midfielder on the roster. Yeah, they can't get Kaiseido Kaiseido over the line, which would have been incredible if it was him and mm. Enzo, but it's not. Um, yeah, I don't know. Just not not gonna believe, you know. Um think they'll drop enough points in in stupid ways probably i think that's a, my, my a other good way pick. to sum them up yeah oh man i really don't want to mess with these teams at the bottom <laughs> i guess i'll go everton over there we go everton right, over let's... baby there it is i think the as far as the blob goes um they're more towards the middle of it than the bottom of it maybe 15 14 um, I think they'll consolidate a little bit. I like Daesh. I like Dan Juma a bit. Um, and I think they'll just be solid. And I think they're better than you can easily say. I think they're better than like five ish teams at least. And it doesn't take that much to get 41 points. I mean, you could get, you could finish 15th on 41 points. So yeah, give me the over Everton. Let's go. Um, I spent like the past, two weeks thinking about how like I'm, I'm ready to relegate Everton already and <laughs> oh, um, but I'm always ready to do that so it doesn't matter but uh, I had a, a conversation with these two gents last night and they made me feel a little bit better because I think that this team if, if you look at like they we know what their their problem is going to be it's that uh, they're not going to score because yeah. Dominic Calvert-Lewin despite being 40 to 1 to win the golden boot uh, I mean, uh, 40, how, to uh, one? 40 to 1, 40 to 1, be 4,000 to 1. Yeah. <laughs> it should be 40 to 1 to go over 15 games played or 15 yeah. games played. Like, this is, uh, I think 
the, the way that Everton is kind of approaching the season is just as if Dominic Calvert Lewin isn't on the team, and if he yeah. sometimes he, he just might show up as like a a, a testimonial player or something like so that. a celebrity goal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Who's here? Look who's here today. It's it's, it's, it's like it's DCL. playing beer pong at a frat house. Right. And DCL shows up. Celebrity shot, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right, dude. <laughs> uh, but I think that this team is has the right manager and then the right foundation to win yeah. one nil or two one games when they need to. Uh they've got a great goalkeeper. Uh I, I don't think because of how much of a mess they were last year, I don't realize I don't think people just realized how good Pickford was last year. It just kind of became normal watching an Everton match and be like, oh my God, he just he probably just saved three clear cut <laughs> chances yeah. in this game that they 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 ended up like wrestling control of the game maybe in a way and, and winning like one nil and be like they should have been down three nothing at halftime. Um and then they just have like a responsible enough center back and, and midfield uh kind of foundation with, with Tarkowski and uh Branthwaite should be good. Keen Godfrey, like there's just enough there and I think they need another center back. I think Ashley Young too was like kind of like the perfect fit for them in a weird way. He's he might they might be the only team that he made sense for. In the entire <laughs> Premier League, but he made so much sense for them. Uh, and then with like Ghana, Onana, and Garner in the middle, I think I just think that their ceiling is high, uh, and their floor is high enough. With with Dyche to say that I would have I would have went over too. I just didn't want to take them because um, I don't want to jinx them. So I'll be with you. And they, they also one. have a real home field advantage, which yeah. isn't always a given but i just feel like against the bottom blob at home with dice like i expect a lot of clean sheets i expect a lot of points there and i can't really say the same for a bunch of the teams there at the bottom yeah i mean it was interesting because you would watch like a a everton must win match at like 10 a.m on a saturday morning at goodison and then maybe southampton play it at 12 30 later that day and be like there's a there's just a massive difference between the two (laughs) the two like home fields yeah, so that's actually a good point as well. Uh, BJ, did you want to say something there? I was going to say, I, I I love that we've basically implanted the word blob in your brain now. Out oh, that's, that's now fully it's just stuck in your head. And you, it's like, it's a lot to easier that. than me being like the bottom nine-ish like every <laughs> single time. I'm just like, it's a blob. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Walsh, say, Walsh, will, Walsh will appreciate that, I think. Oh, yeah. yeah. He Absolutely. Will love it. Um, <laughs> I think I'm up next, right? You are. Yeah. And you, you, you also can't... Can, can take Everton over 40 and a half points. No, I'm going to take a team that might even surpass <laughs> Everton this season. Um, I'm going to go Luton town over 29 and a half points. Uh, I think Man City is like the least interesting team from a betting perspective in the entire market. Uh, like I'm writing about them for the preview that we're doing and I'm like having writer's block and like what to write about them <laughs> other than like they're good. Who cares? Um, but Luton town's very interesting because and Anthony pointed this out on our preview pod last night is like, they have the lowest expectations of anybody since, I think Huddersfield coming up to the Premier League when they had the negative expected goal differential, and Luton Town though when I was I was studying them last night or the yesterday, they play a very unique style that I think can lead to some high variance and they can pop a couple times as an underdog where they like they led the championship with 427 high turnovers that was 61 more than Sheffield United wow. like they and, and somebody described them as they don't press they chase the ball. Like they just are all over the pitch everywhere. It's, it seems like it's like not working, but also at the same time, like they create a lot of chances in transition. Like they have good structure at the back. I mean, they, they only allowed 0.97 XG per 90 in the championship. Like if you go back to last season, that was better than what Bournemouth did. That was better than what Nottingham Forest did in the championship. So, and I get it. Like the talent is so much further down than even Sheffield United is right now. You know, if you look at transfermarket.com, I think their total squad value is 60 million. I think that's wow. the lowest I've ever seen of a team coming up to the Premier League since Huddersfield. Um, but I think they do have a, 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 dis, a distinct style that can actually work for a brief period of time in the Premier League. Now, and then you have to look at it like we already been talking about against the blob. Are they really are they really 12 points worse than Fulham? Are they really 10 points worse than than Wolves is right at their current state right now? I mean, talent-wise, you'd say yes, but I mean Rob Edwards did a fantastic job taking over from Nathan Jones and and pushing them forward to get the Premier League. I understand the underlying metrics aren't quite what Sheffield United or Burnley was, 
but this is such a low bar to clear. Like, unless they finish essentially in like the very bottom of the table, they should clear 30 points. So, uh, I actually, I'm the more and more I read about Luton, I'm liking them more and more just because <laughs> that bar is, I mean, they're minus 300 to be relegated, like against the blob. That's, a, that's, that's an insane price against the blob. Oh um, so over 29 and a half, I think is, uh, you know, the bars is super, super low for this team, but I'm starting to like them more and more by the day. Huddersfield uh, stayed up the first year. We did. They only yeah. had a minus 0.4 XG difference per 90. They couldn't score, but they also defended enough to stay up. And then the second season, uh, we don't talk really, about the second was season. really rough, but like, <laughs> you know, you can magic it for a year. Like we had this conversation last year and we were all saying Bournemouth stinks, no chance dead. Why even play? It just, just take, the, take the relegation. <laughs> they stayed up relatively comfortably in the end. Like it just, there's yeah. so much variance in predicting these teams coming up from the championship. Play yeah, styles and actual talent. How much do they lose? I mean, Luton didn't lose as much as Sheffield or, uh, or Burnley in a way. No, they. I don't yeah. think they lost anybody, did they? So, they're in theory they made some you know, good purchases con- to be con- honest. Yeah. Continuity. Yeah. Uh, it's twenty nine and a half, man. It's I'm crazy. Sorry. I mean, even with like just low, the, like when you I'm surprised when, when you factor in drafts. like a twelve point twelve point like bump for just having a chip on your shoulder, like first. Premier League season in, in and honestly, like, kind of the first home, home game advantage too. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna exactly. bring up the home right. field advantage. Who's their no first one? game at home? I know they're at Brighton. It's against Brighton. Burnley. Burnley. Yeah. yeah so oh, that's, three that's points. a win. I, I was looking yes, the other day. And, uh, <laughs> that's a win. The they're gonna live, be catching they, a half goal. The live yeah, score straight. app said that match was postponed. I don't know. If I saw that too. I don't oh, know. Yeah, if it is. It is ready yet. It is postponed. I know because that's a fantasy type of thing. That the stadium isn't ready yet. Yeah. I don't think so. You got to be kidding. All right, maybe I'm out. They had to make upgrades to like meet Premier League standards. Yeah, yeah they had right? to get the 10K, right? Yeah. So I don't know. But hey, they could definitely do this. I mean, they could finish, they could literally finish in 17 or in, you know, they, 18, they could easily 19, be relegated. Place. Yeah, they could finish place. 18th or 19th relegated. and clear 29 and a half. Yeah, they could, exactly. they could finish yeah. dead last and clear, clear yeah. 29 yeah. and a half. Yeah. 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 You just got to get points against pick. the blob. That's all I, you got. But, I do think that 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 home field actually does matter for a team like this when, like, you're gonna ask Kevin De Bruyne to go to that stadium, like, and those <laughs> kind of players, like, it's it's almost a little bit like the Arizona Coyotes in the NHL, and, and we talked about how that Mullet Arena, the college rink that they're playing in, is it's gonna be a factor, and it was. They were really good at home. They were a great bet at home. They're like plus two hundred every every home game in the NHL, and they they almost were five hundred at home. Like, I think that stuff matters. Uh, to professional athletes who can just like walk into a, a stadium like that and be like, where am I? Um, <laughs> like Luton to... could be Luton could be like literally the most profitable team on the body line this season. If they just pop a couple times at 13 or 14 to one, yeah. like they could, yeah. they could do it. So um, what you're saying home, is every single West week Ham, game week yeah. four, home wolves game week right. six. Right. Every uh, week we're going to have this pod and, and Michael's going to say, well, you know, it's very difficult to go to Luton because yeah, the, try to, the, yeah. Stadium the mullet arena, the mullet arena of England. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I went to, when I went to the World Darts Championship last year. I saw Leighton Orient play Sutton United at uh, Leighton Orient's home ground, and it's, you know I think that seat's like eight thousand. And imagining that it was snow everywhere that 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 stretch, awesome. and just just imagining uh, Jurgen Klopp going there. Like he, what would he complain? He would complain about the entire thing. He would probably try to get the game <laughs> moved or something. Like, can we go play this in Riyadh or something? <laughs> uh, all right, that uh, the practice facility on half of these like top teams yeah, exactly. is probably Good. the same size as the same. Dude, I honestly. saw I saw a video from inside a uh, Luton Town's like weightlifting thing. It looks like they're literally like in a high school like gym or whatever <laughs> it is. Awesome. It looks like they're like a wa- like That's a, good, man. That's a broken down awesome. warehouse. Grit, you need that. It's grit. That's right. Yeah. It is grit. True grit. Uh, I'm for them. I'll go with the opposite of them. Uh, is on an under. That's uh, City, eighty six and a half. That leaves. Uh, and I, if you were to ask me before who would be the last pick in the draft, I probably would have said it would go down uh, between City and Luton Town. And <laughs> usually just the extremes are kind of yeah. end up being the last in these kind of things. And um, so it's close. But City under, they got to 89 points last year, which it feels low considering just how good they were. Uh, they went on that insane... 30 match on beaten streak or something like that uh, after the new year 
after they lost to Tottenham. Was it they lose to Tottenham four two or something, or they beat and they Tottenham lost to us one nil? Yeah, yeah, and then they beat yeah, and it was they they weren't giving up any goals and. Just think about how good they were during that stretch. It, it ended up being like 26 matches unbeaten. And they still only got to 89 points. That just tells you how hard it is to, to get to that total. And I think everybody is, and maybe it's cliche to to assume it, that they'll come out of the gates a little slowly as uh, they get off the beach. But um, it, it can't, I can't take an over on this team at 86 and a half points with just how good the chasing pack now is and how deep it is. Mm-hmm. It's not, they're not just fending off Liverpool. They're not just fending off Arsenal. They're now fending off, you know, a, 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 a true blob of, uh, <laughs> of seven other teams. Plus, you know, if, if Neil Malpai put, has his scoring boots on, you, you never know what, what, what Everton ceilings like. So you might be a blob of, yeah. yeah Dan Juma. 201 uh, for golden boot, by the way, Dan Juma. Five. I mean, I would not take bad. that over. Calvert Lewin at forty to one, a million percent, <laughs> <laughs> literally I every take, time. Uh, it's funny though. There's one team I didn't want, and now I'm stuck with them. Yeah, and and it's because you you still don't believe in the Steve Cooper experience, even though he was <laughs> he showed us that I literally the, don't have one note the, for this team. The like, thing for, I literally don't know what to write about them. Before Forest, the the one thing for Man City though, in terms of you know blobness, is like, they, who are they losing to in the bottom ten? Like just, they're just gonna. There's always one, but like yeah, they'll lose. They'll lose to they'll either lose, like they'll lose to like Brentford or Luton they'll lose, Town is who they're gonna like lose. They'll lose to lo- they'll lose to someone stupid right before uh, right before an international break. But and like then, they're picking up three points almost every other time, like in a, at a consistent level that yeah. like you know two, only two, they do. Two years in a row that Everton held them to a draw at once. There you so, go. Yeah, you if, if the mid table is truly hollowed out, I think City's one of the teams that like. Just, they just they just hoover just up all the points. Up. Yeah, yeah. Brentford did the double against them last year. Yeah, true. Incredible stuff. <laughs> up the bees, up the yeah. bees. Um, so yeah, it's it's a, it's a good point though. Like it's, Tottenham it's, is a bottom half team that will probably take three or four off them. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but now that we so that was uh, eighty six and a half points. I'll take the under on City. Uh, Forest that leaves us with you, Anthony, and Forest, and they're at. Uh, at the moment, 36 and a half points. I kind of don't remember anything about them even last year. Like, I feel yeah. like, like, like they're which not is, real, which is, we, yeah, it's not, it's not real. They felt not real going into the season because of the, the, the absolute insanity with the transfer yeah. market. Like they thought they were a Saudi league team in the transfer <laughs> market. And then now, then they played and I, I don't feel like there was any clear pattern to them at all. And I think actually, that goes to my point about Coop, Steve Cooper is like that he was able to take that mess and keep them up. They played, did they play almost the, like three quarters of the season without a shirt sponsor? Like, what, yeah, what was going on with this team? I don't know, uh, but they're still up. And uh, now you got him. I will. Yeah, he ended the season just blazing every game. Are, are, are we are we on like the Anthony Ilanga train here? Yeah. Seems I don't good. Know. Like I'm kind of tempted by it. Is he gonna play over? Taylor Nev- Navas. Johnson Remember when Taylor Morgan Navas was their goalie? I mean, anybody they signed. You <laughs> oh have yeah, to they, ask. Had they actually they had play. Navas. Navas was there. Like, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna go. You know what? I've bet four on. I've I've given out. I've I've taken four under so far. Um, thirty six and a half. They kind of did find an eleven that worked by the end of last season to yeah. be okay. Yeah. They add Alanga. Maybe are they gonna okay. stay up? That's the bet. Yeah, and I'm going to say that given the circumstances of everybody around them, I'm going over 36 and a half. I have not a lot of conviction. I'm not recommending you go out and bet this wager because <laughs> um, I think it's pretty close to right. But yeah, 36 and a half. Uh, yeah. I like Taiwo. I'm in. Yeah, let's yeah. do it. They had a lot of guys leave, uh, which probably could be better than not. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm tempted enough that I'm going to I'm going to hop in on the train. And back Cooper, which I will immediately regret when he uh, when they start poorly. But yeah, and the home field certainly mattered for them. You know, it's an above average home field. They were competitive and and actually got a lot of points at home. They didn't do shit on the road, so if they're able to replicate that. They go over this, maybe even still go down. I don't know. You know, the way we're talking about this league, it feels like thirty six and a half. If you're over that, you're probably safe this year. But we will see. I'm going over. Yeah, they also might get the best keeper in the world, Matt Turner. Yeah, that's true. Right. That would be a big look. But shot that's... stopping is king. Yeah. Uh, 
there you have it. I think we ended up with like a pretty much even split on overs and unders uh, here. Uh, Alon, uh, we thank you. Tell uh, tell the good folks who, who listen to, to Wonder Goal a little bit about FML, FPL, uh, what you and Walsh have going on over there and um, where they can follow you. All that jazz. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if you play fantasy Premier League, FPL, um, that's what we talk about. We're just, uh, you know, been obsessed with it for like eight years, pod multiple times a week usually, and, uh, yeah, you know, get in there. And we're more fun than a lot of the other ones who take it much, way too seriously. So we just try and have some fun and, and pick some guys and get some points. And I'm sure I said this last year when we did this episode, but we we, we should have you back on, um, especially because, uh, you know, every now and then, BJ or I have to hop off the podcast for an episode or two to mm. to be dads, and Anthony has to <laughs> to be eighteen years old and rich, <laughs> rich, rich off of Morocco money. So, uh, find maybe we'll, awesome maybe we'll hear more from you, um, and you can you can join us for for one of our world famous uh, underdog parlays oh, that that always hit. Uh, who who hit who's the week. guy? Who's the Pedro Neto this year? Like everybody in the world was like, you gotta have Pedro Neto, and then he didn't do shit all year. Who's this year's like Pedro Neto? I mean, it might be Bumo. Bumo. I mean, because he's got a lot of the things you want. He's on pens, takes set pieces. Brentford are pretty good. He's pretty cheap, but he's also like just really bad at finishing. And he just loves to hit the bar. And he might just finish with like three goals. And maybe they just don't get a penalty because they're Brentford and they have two attackers. And, you know, so he, he so could definitely be a Wimble? bait. And he's yeah. really highly owned. Um, is, here's another question. Is is there literally anybody on Wolves that you want from, from a fantasy perspective? <laughs> Not even a little tiny bit. I mean, okay. I have a friend who's a Wolves about that fan. Episode. I have a friend who's a Wolves fan and... We were ripping into Wolves, just like skip, like no one there. And he was like, our defense is good and like blah, blah, blah. We're still going to be. And I was just like, dude, give me a give me a blanking break with this team. Like they're not even that cheap. Like their keepers five. Like there's just nothing there. There's really nothing there. Last uh, question. How, how insanely expensive is Holland this year? Yeah, I mean, he tied the record for most expensive at fourteen million. Which, uh, <laughs> yeah, if you subtract, you know, like the bench guys and whatnot, is a you know, I don't know, tw- almost twenty percent of your budget, like seventeen percent of your budget or something, right there. And so you, you're still it, owning him, right? You kind of gotta. I mean, to start <laughs> to start the season, like right now, he's eighty six point six percent owned. So if That's you don't crazy. own him. Insane. And they're going to Burnley game week one, and he just hat tricks. I mean, you're just toast. Season's yeah, over. Or, yeah, yeah, like you're, you or can't. Or if he gets abducted by that. aliens, all of a sudden you're right. Yeah, you, you've you've wiped out such a, a huge big, portion of the field. A lot of times, what happens with these guys who who come in at fourteen is like the sooner, like the quicker you are to hop off of them, might make the biggest difference in your season. Right? It's like because I kind of expect Holland to like get hurt or miss some games or not be as ridiculously hot as last year or something city to be weird at the beginning of the season. But like most people are just going to hold them because the, the smart thing is to be, you know, conservative in this game and just be like, no, but it's Holland. And he, you know, doesn't matter that they're, they're going to kill all these teams, but you know, maybe going off him sooner than others might, might be the push for a good rank. We'll see. Uh, Final question for me before you go. Is there a, a player, um, and, and if this is out of bounds, you can say out of bounds and you know, no spoilers. <laughs> um, but is there a player that you have a have circled and, and maybe it was Wisa, but like that isn't being talked about much that uh he's like your guy, he's he's the one you're taking it the hill you're gonna die on. I and mean, I am a Mopa? big Wisa guy and he's very, very low percent on versus Umo, who's highly on, which is kind of a weird quirk. But um, I I like Eze, too, but I am a little bit scared, as Anthony highlighted, with their business. I mean, he's really good, and he has everything that I like in a fantasy player, and he's on pens now that Zaha's gone. 
but if if he's the only attacker on this team, <laughs> I'm a little worried about going backing this boy Hodgson player to, you know, keep scoring goals and keep getting into the box and all that stuff. So I'm tentative on him right now, but I, I got, I got eyes on people. We'll see. All right. Big uh, week ahead. Big to week hear, ahead. To hear who you, who you have eyes on. Uh, and, and if you're into fantasy premier league, make sure to listen to the FML FPL pod uh, with Alon and Walsh. Um, be sure to rate review and subscribe that podcast rate review and subscribe <laughs> uh, wonder goal uh, so that we can, keep our numbers up and make our sponsors and bosses happy uh, and remind them that we exist as we head into <laughs> NFL and college football season. Um, <laughs> but uh, until then uh, we'll be back next week with our, or later this week with our uh, week one deep dive, tell you why we're all betting uh, Brentford yep. and Luton and all these other terrible teams uh, that'll break your heart against better teams um and on that note i will leave it there thanks to our sponsors bet365 i'm michael leboff for alan shapiro bj cunningham anthony debundo this has been wonder goal thank you for listening